Hey guys, quick announcement. So I'm hoping you'll be very excited about this. The Suzanne Venker show is now going to drop three episodes per week. In addition to the main one that gets dropped on Sundays, for those of you who are regular followers, you probably know that where there's going to be two additional ones on Tuesdays and Thursdays, shorter versions, real quick ones. But, um, There's just too much that I want to cover that I can't cover once a week. And I also want to do, um, have a few, have fewer guests on as well. I'm still going to have guests on periodically, but you'll be hearing mostly from me going forward. So, um, I recommend subscribing to the show. So you get notifications with the topic of the day, each time a new episode has dropped. And also please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. So you get free books and an early release of each episode episode. Plus, those who sign up at the $10 level get a 100% free digital copy of my brand new book, How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched. You can do all of this at SuzanneBanker.com forward slash podcast. And now on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about an article in the Daily Wire I'm going to do more than talk about it. I take that back. I'm going to actually read it. I'll tell you the title and where you can find it. But, um, well, it's at the Daily Wire, but the Daily Wire is a members only uh, platform. So if you are not a member, you won't be able to access it, which is one of the reasons why I'm going to read it to you. And it'll be really obvious why I am as I'm reading, because you'll, you'll see the connection between this article and, and, um, my work. So there's a new book out by Brett Weinstein and Heather. I never know if it's hang or hying H E Y I N G. And for those of you who don't know, this is the, both of these individuals are evolutionary biologists and they are married. And as a team, they're pretty formidable. And I can see, I I think most people probably haven't heard the name, the names. Um, They're not quite mainstream, but they are in the world of, um, you know, evolutionary biology, if you, if you're big on that. So they have a new book out called A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, which is pretty brilliant. And this article that just went up at the Daily Wire is called An Evolutionary Biologist's Guide to Finding Love in the 21st Century. So already I'm imagining you all going, oh yeah, I can see why Suzanne wanted to talk about this article, or as I said, more specifically, actually read it to you. I'm not going to read it word for word, but I'm definitely going to be reading the chunk of it. So get ready. Um, It's really important. It's, it's, it's really everything, in my opinion, in terms of consolidating what has happened between women and men and where we need to go from here. Um, let's see, really quick, um, just to give you an idea of the book, The Hunter Gathers Guide to the 21st Century, it's, it's described as a bold, provocative history of our species, finds the roots of civilization of civilization's success and failure in our evolutionary biology. For evolutionary biologists Heather Hang, Hang, and Brett Weinstein, the cause of our woes is clear. The modern world is out of sync with our ancient brains and bodies. Okay, so with that as the background, knowing that this article is essentially encapsulating that, that new book they have out, let's get going. They open with the uh, statement, with a statement about birth control, because really, 
the whole thing begins and ends. The whole the whole issue with what's happening between women and men today goes back to sex and what changed sex, but birth control. So it's a brilliant opening. Whether we care to admit it or not, we are overwhelmingly agreed on the value of birth control. By freeing us to plan the timing and size of our families, reliable birth control has liberated women to strive and achieve alongside and on par with men. The gains in sexual equality that have been made in a half a century are nothing short of staggering, largely due to birth control, and the benefit to humanity is all but deniable. I should pause here because you might be wondering why I'm... You, you might be wondering... These folks are liberal. They're self-described self -described liberals. I forgot to add that. But you need to temper that with the reality of the fact that they are straight shooters and they are 100% honest. So they're taking, so while that's their bent, they are evolutionary biologists and that's grounded in science and truth. So they are, in fact, they were actually ousted, I think, from um, where they were teaching. One of them was because they are not politically correct. So just hold on here and don't make assumptions from that first opening. But that staggering benefit has come with staggering costs. As unfair as the pre-birth control world may have been, it had a recognizable logic to it. Sex was scarce because reproductive behavior carried sobering implications, especially for women who did not secure commitments from their partners in advance. Courtship may ultimately be about costs, benefits, obligations, and enforcement. But that's not how it feels when you're falling in love. Still, human courtship was built around a few unchangeable facts. Men and women will be drawn to each other. And because human babies are so very labor-intensive to raise, women with a choice in the matter will be incredibly careful about sex so as not to produce children on a lustful whim. That carefulness will be vigorously, sometimes coercively supported by women's close kin, both male and female. The sexual caution of women and the caution exerted on women's behalf evolved to counter the inverse instincts of men who, if not driven to a nobler objective, may spend a lifetime hunting for evolutionary bargains, seeking to produce offspring that will be raised without any investment beyond the sexual encounter itself. Now, if any of you know anything about evolutionary biology, that's just straight up you know, evolutionary biology 101 right there. Okay. And, and by the way, they're, she's, they're describing here about the way it's been up until now, I should say that whole, uh, explanation about how, um, you know, uh, women's close kin helping women be cautious and all of that, the, as you and I both know, that's no longer going on today, but she, they're describing how it has been all the way up until recently. Acceptable patterns of sexual behavior derived from this evolutionary asymmetry between women and men are inscribed into the rules of every culture and civilization and are suffused throughout the myths and narratives, narratives that constitute our instruction, our instruction manuals. Ready? Birth control rewrote those rules. Suddenly, arbitrarily, and irreversibly changing a fundamental part of human nature. This shift wrecked the sexual logic that governed the system, providing nothing with which to replace it. Most fundamentally, the problem is this. Sex is a means to an end. It is about the production of offspring. But as in so many things for humans, the original function has been overlaid with additional ones. Humans are no ordinary species, and the production of offspring is not a simple matter of sperm meets egg or boy meets girl. Humans are born utterly incompetent, and competence is not encoded in our genes so that it simply just emerges if we're fed and protected through physical maturity. Though we are not blank slates at birth, we are the blankest slates nature has yet produced. 
This is not some cosmic error, some massive disadvantage our species has overcome. On the contrary, it is the key to our unique success. But that unscriptedness of human offspring creates some very special requirements. Human babies are not well raised by mothers alone. They are best raised and mentored by a team. Hold on here. Ideally, an extended family embedded within a community. But at a minimum, a mother and a father united in a lifelong partnership with total dedication to their brood. Sex is amazing. No two ways about it. Evolution made it irresistible for an obvious reason. The joy of it is the ultimate incentive. And if a man needs to agree to a lifelong partnership with a woman to get some, most men will willingly do so. And because women are incredibly choosy about partners, i.e. should be choosy about partners, men need to do more than simply agree to stick around. They need to demonstrate their worth not just in absolute terms, but relative to other men who are also looking to impress eligible women. Men become very choosy about life partners too, just like women. But men don't focus on all the same characteristics as women do when looking for a spouse, although they naturally have equally high standards. Our point is that humans are at our best when men and women are holding each other's feet to the fire while working to be worthy of partnership. The scarcity of sex and the choosiness, sorry, and the choosiness, yeah, the choosiness it produces gets everyone striving. Liberals were right. Physical challenges aside, women can compete with men, and humanity has benefited greatly from their successful liberation. That's the word she uses. That wouldn't be the word I would use, but okay. But conservatives were right about something equally important. The unintended consequences of a sexual free-for-all would be disastrous and largely unpredictable. Traditionally, every straight member of both sexes wants to marry up. No one wants to be left behind or betrayed. It's a very serious game that we are built, wired, and programmed to intuit. And although the players haven't gone anywhere, the rule book was destroyed. Let me say that again. Although the players haven't gone anywhere, you know, you're constantly hearing where have all the good men gone. The rule book was destroyed and replaced by an arbitrary and rapidly changing set of assertions made up by people who don't even seem to remember the objective of the exercise. Sex is thrilling in large part because traditionally the stakes have been incredibly high. But sex isn't scarce now. By lowering the stakes and by suggesting to women that the reason they weren't thrilled by the idea of casual sex was that they were being oppressed by men who wanted to control their minds and their bodies, we have created a sexual dumpster fire in which the false sophistications of the moment are used to pressure women into abandoning requirements for commitment. A woman who wishes to opt out of casual sex is taken to be evidencing of one of several def uh, defects. Either she is imagined not to like sex, which is incredibly unsexy, or she does like sex and is denying it to herself because she's okay with being oppressed. To avoid that trap, many women go along and discover that for deeply wired, hormonally mediated reasons, they usually cannot help but develop Strong feelings for the men they sleep with. Men are wired in the opposite way. Sex very early in a relationship inhibits the feelings that would otherwise cause them to fall in love. Men and women can and should have equal opportunity in all realms, but we are not the same. Now I'm going to pause there for a moment. There's, there's more. But everybody listening now definitely knows <laughs> why I had to read this and why I had to let you know about this this book and these folks in case you don't know. And by the way, they have a podcast, um, sorry, that is called Dark Horse Podcast. I think it's just Brett Weinstein's podcast. I'm not sure if she's on it or not, the wife. Um, but at any rate, so that's a book and a podcast and, and now this article. 
Um, they are explaining here in a very, you know, much more scientific way what I've been espousing forever. You know, this, this idea that women really do and could and should be like men if they would just be uninhibited and understand that everything about the way they respond to sex is actually a social construct instead of biologically um, wired into them. So it's, it, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to have a, um, a, an author espouse these facts and it's another for it to come directly from evolutionary biologists. So um, that's why I'm taking the time to read this entire, well, most of this article. There is no easy way out even for people armed with this knowledge. A woman who demands commitment competes for male attention with every woman who doesn't. And that's a fairly hopeless situation. As willing women engage in a race to the bottom, broadcasting easy sexual availability and low standards. This is exactly what's happening across college campuses today. That's me talking, not them. I'm, I'm throwing that in there because I'm watching it from a distance as now that I have two kids in college. And I'm sure many of you do too. A man is better positioned to opt out of the modern sexual chaos if he wants, but his ancestral wiring is set to overwhelm him with fear of missing out on sex without commitment, the sweetest deal in the known universe. Of course, he's being a sucker too. And, and then they get into... How, <laughs> um, well, they, they said next, consensual sex is delightful to men because it has traditionally been an indicator of spectacular evolutionary achievement. But of course, we can see, especially on college campuses, where it's getting them, can't we? I mean, I don't know if any of you got wind of the, um, the various rape accusations at about three or four colleges just in the last month alone. Two of them were at Kansas University and the protests that ensued. And, and this, this, of course, isn't news in and of itself, but um, and now that we're right back on campus, just about a month or so, it's, it's, um, it's starting again. And that would be an example of how men, men are being suckers, too, and they need to be just as responsible for how to get out of this, which we're going to get to in a second. There is a way out of this mess. They write, smart young people should opt out of the incoherent free-for-all together. They should establish a set of rules for how they will treat each other in the context of mating and dating and a set of standards to which they will aspire and hold each other. There is no reason we can't have the benefits of family planning i.e. birth control, without destroying the coherence of family and of civilization. And what a delightful achievement it will be if we can find our way there. And that's the end of that article. Now, there might be people who would disagree, and that's perfectly fine. I happen to agree with this wholeheartedly. Birth control is here to stay. You cannot put the genie back in the bottle. So the only way forward is to marry the reality of birth control with the reality of human nature, which has been my argument all along. As to how to do that, they, of course, are suggesting that both men and women are responsible for getting us out of this mess, and I couldn't agree more. I'm going to do a whole thing on just speaking to young men and how they can and should respond to this phenomenon to make sure that they are not, as they put it, become suckers themselves. But for now, I'm just going to say that I'm still going to uh, um, emphasize my argument all along, which is that women have to lead the way. Women have to lead the way. I mean, if you if you closed your eyes and just imagine for a moment tomorrow, for some crazy reason, all the women, unmarried women, young unmarried women, um, decided collectively that they're not going to have sex with any man, um, you know, for the, I don't know, the first three or four months of a uh, new relationship, where after they're, you know, the man is already all in and bonded and, and then, you know, in other words, love is there first and then the sex as opposed to sex, no love, sex before love and all of that. Um, <laughs> just think about that for a moment, hypothetically, if, if they did that. Of course, that will never happen. But I'm just saying, what would result 
think about everything that would change so dramatically if women collectively decided that. My point in mentioning that isn't, um, yes, that can't, that's not going to happen. My point is to say, look at the power women have. That's the power they have. So there are things men can do for sure. And as I said, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that separately in, a, in its own podcast, but the reality is the dating landscape today is a, is a minefield and there are absolutely no guardrails, no, no, no points of, um, there's no, there's no roadmap. There's no, it, they're just shooting blanks. They really have no idea what they're doing today because of everything that they just described in terms of how we got here and where we are. And it's been, the old rules have not been replaced with anything new. Now, obviously I do have, um, I do have rules in my um, books that, that, that can be used for sure. Um, I, in fact, I have a, a specific eight dating rules from one of my books that I'm going to pluck out and, um, you know, separately to have so people can read how to move forward in the way that these two authors are suggesting we do because that's exactly because they're exactly right. We are missing a set of rules that work. We we got out, we got rid of the old ones and we replaced them with absolutely nothing. I wanted to take a moment too to just read a couple of um, comments from that article in the Daily Wire. And once again, if you're just joining us, you're not going to be able to access this article if you're not a member at the Daily Wire. And so that's why I've taken the time to read it to you so that you don't have to join in order to hear it because that's how important I believe this article is. Um, One guy named Jack said, I'm starting to see some, quote, evolutionary nostalgia, especially among men once they enter their 30s. I think once men get out of college and realize they're working, 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 it becomes void of meaning without a home life. I've talked to several men who lament that they can't find a suitable partner. They're ashamed to admit that they want a wife who will create a home and a family for them because it isn't PC to do that now. I think women in their 30s are torn between leaving work when they're at their prime time to promote and be competitive and in their last decade of fertility. Amen. That's exactly right. That's what's happening. That's from Jack. Here's another one um, whose name I didn't get. I'm a 45-year-old single man and that who has never married or had children. I've traveled the world, made a great living, had lots of consensual sex with lots of women in many different places. If I had a time machine, I'd go back to my early 20s, marry one of the girls I probably could have and would have been a virgin on our wedding night. I'm not particularly religious. It just seems that as I get older and gain more experience, there appears to be a great evil at work. The science is something observed in the physical world, but there's something so sinister behind it, something we can't see. Birth control, go crazy in college and then settle down, spring break, wait until you get the right position at the right company, and then have a family. Paternal and maternal leave. Okay, wait, now time to get married. It's like the whole gambit of Western culture has become a twisted ritual designed to turn the one truly wonderful thing that can exist between two people on its head. And I thought that was a good way to end this particular episode. Speaking, again, that was from a single man in his 40s looking back. And um, what could be better than to to heed the advice of somebody who's who's tried it on for size and realizing that um, it's empty in the end. So once again, um, the title of the article, if you do have a Daily Wire account, is An Evolutionary Biologist's Guide to Finding Love in the 21st Century. It's written by Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying. They are married evolutionary biologists. He has a podcast called Dark Horse, and they have a new book out called A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, which I highly recommend, although I haven't actually read it yet. I haven't got my hands on it, but I've read everything about it. And, and, and then of course this article. So, um, just wanted to share all of that with you and more to come soon. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Before you leave us, I'd appreciate it. If you take one minute to give us a review at Apple podcasts or whatever platform you use, if you've done that already, or if you can't leave a review on your podcast player, for some reason, please consider sharing the show with a friend or a family member. Word of mouth is the primary way we get the word out about the Suzanne Venker show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.